There are 4,600 staff members at the SEC. We're pretty small, but last year we bought it, brought in over $4 billion in fines. So we do our job. We do our job well. We're cash flow positive. However, <laughs> however, there is trillions of dollars in the markets in retirement. And we, as the 4,600 people, we're never going to police it all. So we want you to be educated, to be better investors, to make good decisions and avoid fraud. So we are today going to teach you about investment fees, products, and risks. Some considerations to make, key tips to avoid investment fraud, and then how to plan for retirement. This is an interactive class, Ask Questions. I am here to help you. A little bit about my background. I have been with the SEC since, oh my gosh, 18 years ago I joined the SEC. And before that, I was in private practice in one of the largest law firms in the world in New York City. And after defending someone after an SEC staffer came in and took a deposition, I was sitting at this table looking at my client, looking across the table, looking back at my client and thinking to myself, you did this and I don't like you. I went back to my office and I applied to the SEC and two weeks later I joined the SEC in New York. So I have been doing what I believe a great service and helping investors every day and putting bad guys away and I love it. So uh, next slide. We're going to talk today to help you figure out what is all this noise about investing? How many of you have retirement assets that you're saving for? How many of you are in the TSP? All of you. You're all investors. Today I hope to make you smarter investors. Next slide. So we're going to talk and I'm going to give you some of the lingo that you may hear so that you can understand when people are talking and they're making some mumbo jumbo noise to you and you're just nodding your head because it sounds really great. Today I'm going to make you understand what they're saying. So there are three main asset classes, three main asset classes. There is cash, everybody knows cash, bonds, which are IOUs, we're going to talk about those and stocks. We're going to go into each one a little bit more so you can understand some of the lingo about it. But within those asset allocations, asset classes, there are certain investment types and each carry different returns and risks. So for cash, you save cash in a savings account. You go into USAA or into your credit union here and you put money into a savings account. What do you get? A small rate of return, right? Your returns are pretty low. But the money's guaranteed in there. As long as you leave it in, if the bank goes under, you're still going to have your money backed by the FDIC, right? It's guaranteed. CDs are certificates of deposit. Those are, you can invest for a short period of time, three month, 10 month, and it'll pay you a set rate of return at the end of that. It's a simple bank product, and it's a way to just make a little bit more rate of return. But your money is locked up for that time period. And money market funds are actually, if you put your money into a brokerage firm, or an investment advisory firm, they will put your money in what they consider like a savings account, very low risk, backed by treasuries, US treasuries, very low risk, and this is a way just to get you a little bit of return on your money, right? But what's the problem with this? Inflation, right? We're not gonna make any money for retirement if we're, we're making less than 1% on our money, but inflation's going up by two. We've got a long time to live, and we all wanna retire, hopefully in a beautiful beachside facility, right? So how are we going to save that money? Cash is not going to do it alone. But bonds are the next asset class up. These are IOUs and we're going to talk about what types there are individually, but it gives you a predictable income stream. I'm going to give money to Apple, the, the company, to do some research and development. I'm going to buy a bond from them. They're going to pay me back a set rate of return over a set period of time and they're going to pay me that interest twice a year. I get twice a year checks, right? And then at the end of, say it's a 10 year bond, they pay me back my principal. It's no different than if you had a mortgage, right? And they are giving you a 30 year note, a 30 year fixed mortgage. You are paying them every month a set income stream, right? And you're paying off that debt. It's an IOU. You promise to pay the bank that set debt. It's similar to just a loan to a company. Again, the risks and return, predictable income stream, but the problem is there could be an interest rate where it might not match the market, it might be underwater, right? It might not give you enough money to save on. So how do you then get more risk and more return? Stocks and stock funds. These historically have offered the greatest percentage of growth. The downside is it's volatile, right? Markets go up and down, it's hard to predict. 
So there is some risk. So we're going to talk about the benefits and burdens of each of these classes, primarily bonds and stocks. So let's move forward. So stocks. You may hear these referred to as equities. Equities. So when somebody says, I'm in a ton of equities or I'm in high tech equities, what they're saying is, I own stocks. That simple, right? So don't let the noise confuse you. What are the benefits of owning a stock? A stock is you're an owner. You are a percentage owner in that company. My kids and I watch Shark Tank now, and my kids are always like, I want an equity stake in that company, right? Because that's what they hear, but they understand that means I want an ownership stake. The benefits of that are capital appreciation. So if I bought my Apple stock at a dollar and it went up to two dollars, the difference, that extra dollar, that is capital appreciation. It's the way the stock goes up from the price you bought it. Additionally, some companies pay dividends. Now, we all play Monopoly, and you're like, I got a $20 dividend. I don't know what that means. A dividend is where the company has made profits, and instead of putting the money all back in the company, like Apple likes to keep their money for research and development, some companies like to pay it out. Utilities often pay out a dividend, a distribution to their stockholders. So you could be an equity owner and get a little income stream. Some stocks do that. You also, as an equity shareholder, have the right to vote on the annual proxy statement. When people say it's proxy season, proxy is a time when you get to vote. And the companies every year give you a right to vote. Now, if you are like me, I own one share of Apple, right? So it's not feasible, really, for me to make that vote. So the company, the company I bought my stock through, Fidelity, votes for me. They say, everybody that we have that has Apple stock, we're going to vote for them, and we've done the research, and we think you should vote this way. And so you give them your proxy, and I say, you can vote my shares for me. And I've signed up to do that. You can agree to do that. So you get to vote. What are the risks? Well, share price goes down. Recently, Kylie Jenner, I think that's her name. I'm not, not really social and savvy. She said something like, Snapchat sucks. That stock dropped like 50%. It was like a ridiculous drop that day, right? Volatility, right? That was unpredictable. Companies can also go bankrupt. There is no guarantee. By the way, I'm going to be honest with you, back to that disclaimer, I do own Snapchat, right? So I was like, oh, bummer. Um, but companies can go bankrupt. And that is, um, that, that's just a fact of life. Nobody guarantees against that. Poor management, you know, uh, think about a company that has an oil spill. Oftentimes they go bankrupt, clean out that liability, and start over. You are wiped out as a shareholder. Money you invest is not federally insured. There is something true that we're going to say twice today. There is risk inherent in investing, period. There is risk. Nothing is guaranteed with investing. Insurance is a different matter, but with securities, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, there is risk. It's what you pay to get the higher rate. Go ahead. So what are bonds? Bonds are IRUs. They have a predictable income stream paid twice a year, and you get a return of your principal after a set period of time. What are the risks? Credit risk. So how many of you have heard of Standard & Poor's or Moody's? And somebody says, well, I'm AAA rated. What does that mean? There are rating agencies that actually go into the company and audit their books, look at their debt, look at their equity, look at their assets, and say this company is likely going to stick around for a while. They're a good credit risk. It's no different than your own credit score, right? You're a good risk for some, or you could be a poor risk. Well, the higher the risk, the lower percentage they have to pay because they're a low risk, they're going to pay it back. But companies who are more risky, B-level, junk bonds, uh, high-yield bonds, those terms mean that they're a bigger credit risk. They may go bankrupt. And so, therefore, they're going to pay a little bit more for the benefit of having your money. They're going to have to pay more. So the credit riskiness affects the interest rate of the bond. Okay? Next slide. So what types of bonds are there? There's three main types. Corporate bonds. This is, you lend money to a company, you are not an equity owner, you do not get to, you are just a creditor. Uh, so if I paid money to Apple, Apple would then pay me back. That's as simple as that. 
Munis. How many of you have heard of muni bonds or munis? Right. Munis are where government, federal, city, state, local authority, school districts, they want to do some capital projects. They want to build parks. Well, or they want to build roads or infrastructure. They will issue bonds to municipal bondholders and they pay it back. Higher risk, lower risk, lowest risk. Now, munis are actually often um, used and they're, they're actually pretty credit worthy a lot of times. They're cities and states. But what happened in Detroit? Company, the entire city went bankrupt, right? So it can happen. There is a credit risk associated with every bond. Finally, U.S. Treasuries. This is federal government money. This is Treasury bills, short-term cash. This is the Federal Reserve, and it is backed by the full faith and credit of the government. These are the lowest interest producing. This sets the bar, right? The Fed sets the bar for interest rates and what it'll pay for lending money because it is the safest. Between you and me, if the federal government goes bankrupt and they can't figure out their debt ceiling, we should all be running for the hills and getting our like axes and just figuring it out for the zombie apocalypse because this is, these are safest, right? So hopefully in our lifetime, we can continue to have a safe, safe US Treasury. <laughs> Uh, next slide. So let's talk about mutual funds. What are mutual funds? Mutual funds are companies that are formed to pool investor money together to then invest in a certain type of asset class of stocks or bonds or cash in some cases, but it's mostly stocks and bonds. What are the benefits of owning a mutual fund? The benefit are it's professionally managed. It gives you instant diversification. So let's say Fidelity. And again, I'm not saying any particular brokerage firm or name or company name to give it any credibility. I'm just using a name. But let's say USAA offers you a um, mutual fund. They have a professional advisor who picks what stocks are going to go into that fund. They're going to pick, say, 100 stocks, and they're going to manage the amount of each stock in there, and they're going to sell it to you for a price, for a set price. It's affordable. It's a way for you to have an access to 100 different stocks that you wouldn't be able to go buy on your own and manage it all on your own. So it gives you instant diversification and it's liquid. So you can sell a mutual fund. They trade on the New York Stock Exchange, on the NASDAQ, on national exchanges, and you can buy it on the stock exchanges through your broker dealer or directly through your brokerage account. However, you, if you put an order to sell or to buy, they close at the end of the day. So if I put in an order to buy a mutual fund at 9 a.m. through my TD Ameritrade stock or my brokerage account, it would not price until the close of the New York Stock Exchange at 2 p.m. Mountain Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, because they every day aggregate all the value of all the holdings in that mutual fund and then divide it by the number of shares, and that's called the net asset value. And that's, if you have four shares, they're going to give you the net asset value of those four shares and pay you out at the end of the day. So it's not immediate. So if the market's going all over and you're trying to sell your mutual fund, you're not selling it until the end of the day. There are different types of funds, as I mentioned, stock funds. But one of the more interesting funds is a target date fund. This, as we'll talk about in the TSP, is similar to a 2030, 2050, 2040 fund. I own a couple different target date funds. I would really like to retire by 2030. I have a 2030 fund in my personal accounts. I have a TSP account. I have a 2030 fund in the TSP account. But I also have kids. And my kids are now, when they were little, I set up a college fund for them. Don't have a ton of money in there, but I'm doing the best I can, right? I picked a target date fund of the year that they should graduate from high school and need that money for college. When I put the money in when they were babies, they were all in stocks, very heavy in stocks, a little bit in bonds, right? Their diversification was they have a longer time to save. But now I've got kids in high school. I mean, and I'm shocked by that every day, and I'm using a ton of oil of Olay. But I am, uh, I'm, they, their uh, time horizon is now very short. So they have moved into safer, more predictable income streams because we need the money within four years. Next slide. All right, so there are two types of mutual funds overall. Actively traded versus passive. 
Actively traded is where a money manager sits there and says, we're going to have Apple, we're going to sell out of Google, we're going to buy Yahoo, we're going to sell out of this. They attempt to beat the market. They attempt to beat the Dow Joe Industrials or the S&P or whatever market they're in. Passive, they just want to match the market. They're just going to take a basket of stocks and write them up and write them down. They just want that diverse asset allocation across this specific sector, right? Oil and gas sector. Passive, they're just going to buy the 10 largest uh, oil and gas companies and they're going to write them up and write them down. They're not going to trade in and out. What's the big difference? Fees. Which one costs more? Active, right, because you've got to pay the guy who's sitting there every day trading the stocks and his infrastructure and he's got data analytics and he's got computers and he needs to figure out what he's going to try to do to beat the market. It's more expensive. So you need to think about, okay, do I want the passive for a lower fee or active for a higher fee? Depends. We'll teach you what you need to know. Next slide. Here's awesome. This is like, I love ETFs. ETFs are exchange traded funds. They are like mutual funds where they pool investor funds together and they just hold a basket of stocks and they just do it based on a sector. So for example, the triple Q's just holds the stocks that are in the NASDAQ. It's just a diversification. You get one of the, every share in the NASDAQ, right? And that's what you get in the triple Q's. What's cool about it is you get that diversification, but they trade immediately. If I sold my triple Q's, it would execute immediately. If I wanted to be out of the market that day at 9, 9 o'clock a.m. and I put in my order, it would execute immediately. You don't have to wait till the end of the day. The expense ratios are historically lower. It's cheaper. They just have taken a basket of stocks, put it in there, and given you the di diversification. You're not necessarily paying as much for some of the management. They just publicly disclose their holdings daily rather than quarterly. Mutual funds only have to disclose quarterly. And they can be more tax efficient. So you've got to think, with taxing, every time you buy and sell a stock, it's a transaction. There's an income component to that. If you sell within a certain time period, say under 30 days, there's a special tax consequence for that. But if you um, hold your stocks for over a year, that's long-term gains. It's taxed at a lower tax bracket. ETFs can be very tax efficient, and I, I personally, again, just my own personal opinion, I love ETFs. My mom's in a lot of ETFs. Um, so there are index-based and there's also actively traded. So there are fees that you still need to consider with ETFs. Next slide. So let me just, staying right here for a second, we have just covered stocks and the different types of stocks, and we're going to get a little bit more detail there. Bonds, different types of bonds, mutual funds, and ETFs. You pretty much have the universe of investment products. Now you know what to ask for and what to think. So let's think about when you're making investment decisions, what are the considerations? Number one, risk. Risk, risk, risk. If you are willing to take a lot of risk, you could get a lot of reward. But what matters for all of us is our time horizon. Next slide. This is the S&P 500 from 1926 to 2015. This is its annual returns charted out on a map. I did the math. The average annual return over the entire time period is 11.89% per year growth. So if you had stayed in that whole time, you would have made 11% return, almost 12, on your money year after year after year. And so if you can continue to stay in, you've made money. So question for all of you, is time your friend or your foe? Friend or foe? I love it. Okay, so this tells you who's the optimist and who's the pessimist in the crowd. Because it's both, right? If you invest right here and you sell right there, time was so your friend, right? You got in on the low and you sold at the high and you made all this amazing returns. You probably made more than 12%. But if you started investing here and you retired here and need your money, time was your foe. So what we say is the longer your horizon, the longer you're invested, the longer you're taking advantage of this amazing thing called the stock market, you are more likely to have time be your friend. What you don't want to do is make decisions in and out or try to time the market because nobody knows. Nobody knows what the market is going to do. Nobody can predict it. And if they could, I think we would just bronze them because that would be amazing. Nobody can do that. 
So you need to consider your time horizon, and the earlier you get in, the longer your time horizon, the more likely it is you'll hit that 12 percent um, based on historical averages. Next slide. So what is the way to manage risk? You all hear diversification. Diversification across the asset classes, some cash, right? You got to have cash to live on in your bank. Some bonds, especially as you get older, you need some fixed income and some equity. You want to diversify across all of that. But even within those asset classes, you need diversification of the type of holdings you have. You don't want to have, say, I'm invested in stock, but I only own one stock, and I put my entire retirement savings into one stock. Yikes, right? That means that you're not really well diversified. So diversification helps you manage the risk. Next slide. So how do you get that instant diversification? Buy a mutual fund, buy an ETF. Pretty simple. Next slide. How do you pick a fund? Which mutual fund should you buy? There's a kajillion of them out there. What, what do you need to consider? You should consider, number one, which one matches your goals. If my goal is to retire at 2030, I'm going to pick a fund that matches my goals. If my interest is I only want to, um, I want value-based stocks, and I'm going to talk about that in terms of values like moral-based stock, like I don't want to own any cigarette stocks, and I don't want to own any pot stocks, and I don't want to own any beer stocks, right? Those match your values. You've got to find funds that do that, and there are funds that do that. Or I care a lot about having international exposure, right? I think Europe's going to do great things, or Asia's going to do great things. What matches your goals? Find those funds. Then you look at the performance over time. Now, I'm going to give you an example of how this can also go against you. Of course you look at past history, especially if you're paying for an active manager because you want that active manager's advice to continue. That can also play against you. Don't just think because you've picked the best manager who's done well over time that he will always do well, right? Things can always change for managers. So you have to stay on top of it, but past performance is often a predictor of good future performance, but not always. How does it compare with my risk tolerance? What are the fees and expenses? And we're going to cover this one in detail because investors every day leave money on the table that they could easily take with them by picking a more expensive fund when there is something just the exact same offered cheaper next door. And I'm going to teach you how to shop. Then, will it help me diversify my investments? Those are your considerations. So. Before we move on a little bit deeper, I want to help you be better at a cocktail party. So when somebody says to you, I'm only interested in growth stocks, these are stocks that are trying to beat the market and they reinvest their profits for growth. Apple, for example, right? Apple wants to make the next iPhone or the next iWatch or whatever it is they're going to be amazing and come up with next, right? So they're going to take the money that they make from selling all these iPhones and put it back into research and development. It's a growth stock. A lot of tech companies are interested in growing their own business, so they keep their profits. They don't pay out a lot of dividends. As opposed to income stocks, which pay dividends. Dividends, again, are a distribution to shareholders, usually twice a year, of their profits. So for example, General Electric, who's been around for 100-ish years. And they say, OK, well, we're really good at making light bulbs, and you know, this is what we do. Johnson & Johnson, Heinz Company, Kraft, they pay out income because that's what they like to distribute that money back to shareholders. So you can actually own stock, get capital appreciation, and, and have income. These are sometimes better for older retirees, right? I still want some exposure to the stock market, but I want a company that has historically paid dividends. Value stocks. These are companies that, for some reason, are trading below 10 on their earnings per share ratio. These are companies that, for some reason, are a good value based on the assets they have. For example, Snapchat, for a moment, when it dropped 50%, right, that was a good value time to buy Snapchat, right? So it's a value stock at that point. You can actually do the research, and we will teach you on Investor.gov, which is in your handouts, how to do an earnings per share calculation. And you can also just type in Apple, EPS, and somebody on Google will have done it for you. Another way to do it. Blue chip stocks. I'm sure you've heard this term. I own all blue chips. What does that mean? It's a poker term. 
So when you remember, and, or if you play poker, I'm not a gambler, so I'm not really good at it, but there's red, white, and blue chips, right? Red and white are the cheaper ones, but blue were the $25, you know, that was their value, $25 a chip. It was the most expensive chip. They were the best chips. So back in the 20s and 30s, they took that term and applied it to the best companies. So Apple is a blue chip stock. Uh, Kraft is a blue, blue chip stock. Johnson & Johnson, these are venerable, old, good buys that are pretty solid and will likely be around Ford, although they've had their troubles, is a blue chip stock, right? The, another thing you'll hear a lot are capitalization ratios. You'll hear, it's a large cap, it's a mid cap, it's a small cap, it's a micro cap. What does that mean? It's talking about the assets that company has, the capitalization, which is the share price times the uh, number of volume, the outstanding shares. So you can say Apple is a huge company, has billions. It's a large cap. A lot of oil and gas companies here in town, especially independents, are mid caps. They have some assets. They're not, they're not playing with Apple, but they have some decent assets, hundreds of millions. Small cap, 60 million. It may seem like a lot of money, but it's not. In a, in a company world, especially on the stock exchange. So that's a small cap. We're going to talk in a minute about <laughs> penny stocks and micro caps. And I love that you were shaking your head. You and I, simpatico on that. Next slide. So how do you research it? Go to investor.gov. There's a billion ways you can look at stocks. Earnings, earnings growth, revenue, earnings per share. You can look at the amount of debt, dividend growth, price to earnings, 52-week stock price. You can look at all this. But I run carpool, I have a full-time job, and I can barely get dinner on the table, so the likelihood that I'm going to sit down and research a stock on a Tuesday night is zero, to be honest, right? I'm not. So what I will probably do, because I'm an investor who wants diversification, I have my risk, I'm going to buy an ETF, right? I, I don't have time to sit down and figure all this out. If you want to, you should, and you should know what you're doing. We will teach you how to do these ratios, and there are important ways to do it. But I'm a realist, right? I don't have time to really calculate Apple's earning per share over the last 10 years and figure out what the yield curve may be. I'm not doing it. So I'm just going to buy an ETF and call it good. Next slide. So we are talking about those penny stocks. How many of you watch The Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah, Jordan Belfort, lovely gent, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about him in a minute. But um, penny stocks are stocks that are typically less than five dollars per share we used to say less than a dollar per share these all trade typically on what is called the over-the-counter markets and they are called pink sheet companies because in the past in the, when we actually had papers that we traded like at the exchanges you would walk up to a counter and you would get pink sheets they were actually printed on pink paper that's why they're called pink stocks they're highly speculative low value low dollar per share stocks. Oftentimes, these are a hotbed of fraud. I will tell you, I can't tell you what to invest in, but my mother is absolutely never allowed to purchase any penny stocks or, or micro caps, ever. And they are often dormant shells. So Jordan Belfort could buy a, a shell of a company. It had no assets, he'd make it up, right? And he would say, I'm going to issue myself 100,000 shares of a dormant company. Let's call it ABC Company. I'm going to then call all of you in the room, hype up the stock, say it's going to a million. I'm going to get this excitement. The volume's going to spike. People are going to see the stock go up on the stock market. They're all going to buy it. And when it reaches $10 a share, because I got it for nothing, I'm going to sell all my shares. It's a pump and a dump is exactly what we call that. He sold out all his shares. Who's left holding the basket? the individual investors who didn't know better and bought the stock, right? They just paid for his fraud over and over again. That is how a pump and dump fraud works, and they are typically in penny stocks. You will see on the OTC markets, I mentioned that because there is an entire exchange, the OTC exchange. If you are buying stock on the OTC exchange, be very wary of fraud, period. That's not NASDAQ, that's not New York Stock Exchange, it's actually called OTC. There are numerous markets within there, be aware. Finally, if you see a Q at the end of the ticker symbol of a stock, that means that company is in bankruptcy. Don't buy those. Next. 
All right, so what are some of the behaviors? And I always get one of these mixed up, so I have to refer to my notes. And that makes me so sad that I actually refer to my notes. Um, there are certain activities, certain behaviors that undermine performance. Active trading, trading too actively. What happens every time you trade? Like say you're a day trader, and maybe you're good at it and you do that every day. Good for you, but what happens? There's a transaction cost every single time. You're incurring income and you're paying fees, and you're not necessarily doing yourself any favors because we all saw friend can be, time can be your friend, right? If you're actively trading, it can be your foe. It may work for some people, and it worked in the tech boom, but that is a behavior that can undermine long-term performance. The disposition effect. This is holding on to a stock too long. Like, you know, I, I can't give you an example, but let's just say you, sh you're, you know the company's going to bankruptcy, they're disclosing they're going to bankruptcy, and you held it and all the way down. You got to know when to sell. It's Kenny, Kenny Rogers, got to know when to hold them, got to know when to fold them. Focusing on past performance and ignoring fees. Remember I said it's good to look at past performance, but it's sometimes that doesn't guarantee future performance, right? So don't just look on the back performance and don't ignore fees. Those who do well for a long time usually jack their fees up, right? It's more expensive to invest with them because they think they're great. Well, those fees may not be worth the cost of that additional investment. Familiarity bias. This means I buy what I know, right? I buy what I know. So I live in Colorado and I only buy Coors stock, maybe, right? Because I like Coors beer and I'm a Colorado native. Good for me. But what if I didn't actually look around and see what Anheuser-Busch, Miller, well now it's Miller Coors, but some of the other companies were doing. I only bought what I know. I didn't do my full research. There could be better stocks out there. Manias and panics. Oh, we have seen this, right? We have been for a ride since the beginning of 2018 on the stock market. If you had sold when the, when the tariffs were announced and you had sold then, you would have missed the fact that it bounced back up. If you had sold in January and didn't wait till March, all of your gains from 2017 would be wiped out. So don't listen to mania and panic. My rule is have a plan and stick to it. That's what you do in a battle. You have a battle plan. You can be flexible, but you have a plan. You execute to plan. Don't change your decision making based on noise. Momentum investing. This is everybody's buying it. Okay, Bitcoin, like everybody's rushing to Bitcoin now, right? Like it doesn't, that's momentum investing. Is that really what's right for you? Do you understand what you're buying? Why are you investing in that? And how are you investing in that? And are you at the end of a mania, right? That's momentum investing. Noise trading, this is the one I always mess up. I wish, I might have to take this out of my presentation. It's making a decision to buy or sell an investment without the use of fundamental data. Okay, so you're just trading on noise. And an adequate diversification. This is saying, I have cash, bonds, and stocks. I have one cash, one bond, and one stock. That is not adequate diversification. You need to have diversification across your asset classes. Next slide. All right, so now let's talk about fees. All investments, all investments have fees, and they really matter. Next slide. So this is our investor.gov website from the SEC, and this will tell you about how fees expend, uh, affect your performance. I blew up that corner on the next slide, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the difference that fees can have over time. So the green line represents a 4% annual return over 20 years with a 1% fee. You're paying someone 1% to manage your money. The blue line is Again, 4% return, same time period, same return with 0.25 fees. The difference is $30,000, $30,000, just because you paid more in fees for the same return. So fees can really add up. Uh, that's, that's more than college, right? That's a lot of money. How do you keep those in your pocket? How do you make sure that you're getting the best performance for the best fee? Next slide. We're going to help you figure it out. So let's say you want an S&P, a Standard & Poor's 500 index fund. S&P 500 index fund should be fairly cheap. I'm going to check whether Charles Schwab, Fidelity, USAA. I'm going to go and type in Charles Schwab S&P 500 fund, or the ticker of it. Fidelity's ticker fund and USAA's fund. Put in the ticker. It'll pull it up for you. It'll be like getting a car analysis on car, because it'll pull the three up next to you and say, 2% fee, 4% fee, whatever the fees are, and you can say, okay, so for the same assets that I'm buying, which one's cheapest? 
right? What is going to be my benefit and burden of buying at that particular brokerage firm or that particular fund? This fund analyzer is free. Now I'm going to take just a second here to talk about FINRA because you're like, oh, I don't know what FINRA is, right? New York Stock Exchange regulatory body and NASDAQ's regulatory exchange body, they're, they're disciplinary regulators, combined forces in 2007 to form what is called the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. The SEC is on top, we regulate FINRA, FINRA regulates brokers. Remember I said there's trillions of dollars in assets under management, but there's only 4,600 staff at the SEC and even less because we can't backfill spots right now. So we're down to like 4,000 people. We can't manage it all. So FINRA hires people to regulate the broker dealers. They work for us, they are a secure and wonderful organization, and they help you with investment information as well. So FINRA, next slide. So let's talk about fraud, because none of us want to be defrauded, right? Next slide. What's the number one thing you can do to prevent yourself from being taken in as a victim of an investment scam? You can get the background of the person you're doing business with. So how many of you knew that Anyone who sells you a stock, a bond, a mutual fund, an ETF must be registered with the SEC and FINRA. Yes, exactly. How many of you are working with a professional? Anybody? How many of you have checked them out? Yes, good job. Um, with the background check actually is the 80% reduction in fraud just by asking and checking. How many of you want to buy your car, get a Carfax, right? How many of you, when you buy a big screen TV or make a large purchase, you're going to do some research. You're going to get your consumer reports. People, however, need to shift our paradigm because we need to check the person we're giving our largest asset to, our retirement savings. No matter what, work with someone who is a licensed professional and then check them out and read their report. It's free. You should check it every single year because people change. They go through divorces. They have bankruptcies. Things change. Check the person you're working with every year and the firm. And also, see if they have a disciplinary action. Are there customer complaints? Have they been convicted of securities fraud? One of the cases I prosecuted for a guy who said he went to the Air Force Academy and was offering unregistered investments to people in the Centennial area of Colorado recently, he said that he was licensed and registered. He wasn't. And if people had actually gone and pulled his background, all they had to type in was Prendergast, Colorado, they would have pulled him up. And guess where he had been living the years before he was offering these wonderful investments? In Canyon City Correctional Facility for selling securities fraud. <laughs> Hello, right? But nobody checks. So he's back again. He still lives there now. Actually, I think he recently paroled out. But anyway, um, history of customer complaints. That's a big deal. Right? Do you want to work with someone who has complaints or not? And their previous employment. If you can see a lot of stops along the way, what are you doing? Why are you moving so much? Right? What's going on with you? Or are you exactly who you say you are? I work with one broker. I think I must have been the first guy that ever pulled it. I said, hey, I noticed you got an 89 on your test last year. Let's kind of work on that. And he was like, what? And I was like, I'm looking at your CRD before I invest with you. And he's like, thanks. You know, I love it because I've worked hard for my credentials. You know, I've looked, and I want you to know that I am who I say I am. Most people are. Ask and check. Next page. So um, on our website, I love this guy. I wish I could get the video to play it. It won't loop through here. But this wonderful guy, the investors didn't check. He took their, the, the bonus says Karen Sampson, his investor's annual bonus. He's on a yacht drinking it. He doesn't care. So next slide. What is the victim profile? Who is the most often victims of investment scams? Well, here you go. Gents, two-thirds are men. Does that not shatter the myth that it's old ladies who live alone, right? Out in rural parts of farming America, right? The truth is, two-thirds of investment fraud victims are men. Now, ladies, we can do math. A third of us still become victims. But men, 55 to 65 years old, why? Why 55 to 65? What happens? You're retiring. Exactly. What have you done? You've saved your entire life. You've worked your entire life. You're ready to spend your money. You have the most net worth. Fraudsters are smart and they go where the money is. You are the victim profile they want. They are financially literate. All of you are now financially literate. 
You're college educated, a lot of them. They have a recent change in financial health. That's right, they're retiring. There's a change. It's when we go through an emotional change that we become susceptible to fraud. Additionally, they are higher income earners and they're risk takers. All of you are risk takers. You are willing to put your life on the line for our country. You are risk takers. So this victim profile, what I want you to recognize is that it, it is you or it could be you soon. So by recognizing that victim profile, you can be inoculated to fraud. Know that you are targets of fraud. So next slide. Here are key victim profiles. One, you own high-risk investments. That's a private investment. Somebody recently just asked me about an MLM investment. Multi-level marketing, that's an unregistered investment, and that's pretty high risk, guys. Relying on friends and family for advice. 70% of fraud victims invest with someone because they're friended. My most favorite story of this is I prosecuted a guy named Robert Ray White Samples who went to church in Parker, Colorado, just up the street. Went to church for five years and he prayed with his fellow congregation members. And every Sunday he'd pitch him what he called his unregistered investment, and this didn't tip anyone off, but it was actually called Pot of Gold LLC. <laughs> However, <laughs> he wasn't, it, it wasn't a registered product and no one checked. And when I asked every one of the victims why they invested, including the pastor who invested, they said, well, we prayed with him. He was a good Christian. He would never defraud us. We trusted him. When I asked Mr. Samples under oath, why did you steal money from your fellow church members? And he said, well, I was building a beautiful million dollar home and I had to pay the plumber. He didn't care. He didn't care where he had defrauded people. So remember what's good for Sally, what's good for your friend at church, what's good for your, for your um, unit member. Maybe right for them, but not for you. And this is a huge issue we are seeing an increase of in the military, military on military or retirees coming back. When you think it's your buddy, when you think that that's someone you know, stop, stop. It may be, may be great, but you need to ask and check, is that person registered? Have they done their homework? Are they registered with SEC and FINRA? And is the product registered? Do not buy unregistered products, even from your battle buddy, ever. Failing to check the background we've talked about, and they just didn't see it coming. Fraud, victims just don't see the persuasion tactics that are being used. So, next slide. We're going to teach you the most commonly used persuasion tactics. Now, these are everyday, run-of-the-mill persuasion tactics, but we listened to 300 undercover investment fraud tapes that we had gathered with our partners at the FBI. And what we did is we listened to them all, and we identified which tactics were most commonly used to make people pay over their investment dollars. What was it? Number one, in, in this order, phantom riches. People heard the word guaranteed, I can make you rich. I can make sure that your son goes to college. I can make sure that you take your wife on that anniversary trip. It's personalized, phantom riches. I can get you 50% returns in two months, right? It sounds great, we all want it. It's just maybe not real. And when they personalize it to you and what your kids and your family want, oh, that sounds great, right? Like I'd love to be able to send my kids to college and not have to, you work hard for the rest of my life to pay that off, right? I'd love that. Of course I'm going to be interested in learning that. The second one is source credibility. Why did I put on a suit, ish, in a dress, and say to you, I'm an attorney with the SEC, and I'm going to tell you what's on my card. Why did I do that? Because I sound more credible, right? If I had come in here in my yoga pants, would you have listened to me? Probably not, right? But on my business card, we see this a lot. I have... Rebecca Franciscus, Senior Counsel, SEC, JD, and BWE. What's the BWE stand for? How many of you would have even considered going to look? It just sounds, it must be a good credential, right? She's probably, you know, better wealth management or something, right? Well, it stands for best wife ever. And I've earned it, is what I think. And I can print it up on my card, because I can. It's easy, it's cheap. Well, fraudsters put a bunch of alphabet soup at the end of their names. They have fake diplomas. They're like Prendergast said he went to the Air Force Academy. People lie, and credibility can be easily faked. There is on the FINRA website and in your packets the designation checker. If somebody gives you alphabet soup of a business card, don't just say, wow, they must be smart. Go check it. We've prosecuted people for putting HSG as the basis for managing your money. What do you think that stands for? High school graduate. Right? You should give me your entire retirement dollars for that, right? 
social consensus, everybody's doing it. That's Robert Ray White samples, going with the crowd. Be careful. Remember, 70% of victims rely on friends and family. Reciprocity. This is doing a favor for somebody in exchange for something else. So when you're invited to dinner, you bring, you say, I'm gonna bring flowers or a bottle of wine or I'll bring the dessert, right? We have been trained as good humans that you don't just take, you give when you get, right? That's what makes us feel good. It's called reciprocity, and that's what our parents taught us. However, in investment frauds, have you guys been invited down for a free lunch seminar or get a free book or a free, you know, free investing tip, free financial plan? What do they want from you? They want your assets. They want you to invest with them. So the balance of scale, when you go to dinner and bring wine, it's equal. When you go to an investment scam or investment seminar, that wasn't necessarily a pun, um, it, you have a, you know, a $30 steak, $10 meal, whatever, in exchange for your retirement savings, the scale is unequal. That's the red flag. When what you're getting is not equal to what they're giving you, that's a red flag. And people use it against you all the time because when you say, I, you know, I'd love to invite you to dinner, and you say, great, I can do that. Well, I'd love to give you a break on this commission because I think this is a great stock for you, and I'll give you even one of my own shares. You think, great, thanks, you're a nice guy, right? Remember, reciprocity, the balance must be equal. And scarcity, this is the closing tactic. Sir, I've got a guy on line two. I only have one unit left. Do you want to do this? Do you want to get this for your family? Do you want to save for your children? It's that fast talking in your face. Oh my God, I've got to make a decision. There is no investment in this world that is worth a quick decision. Our rule is take a physical step back. Take a physical step back. It breaks the emotional tie of the persuasion and it brings you out from under the ether of the Wolf of Wall Street kind of guy. So take a step back. Next step. Or next slide. Okay, so here's how you check, right? I'm, I'm telling you, you gotta go ask and check. Here's how you do it. Investor.gov, the very first thing that comes up, check your investment professional. It's that simple. Next slide. You can do it on your phone. Um, in fact, if you put in Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street, you'll see a big red X. This individual has been barred. So um, if you go to the next slide, you can see it a little better. I blew it up from the website. It says individual or firm, and then their individual or firm name. So let's say you want to look up Jordan Belfort. Type it right in. It'll pop him right up, big red X, right through his name, right? Or what happens if you can't find someone? Red flag, why aren't they registered? Why aren't they doing what they're supposed to be doing to sell me securities, right? You can also look up a firm name. Had you put in pot of gold, or the product name in there, or uh, you know, A.G. Edwards, or whatever it is, you can figure out in your own backyard who's registered and it takes seconds and it's free. Do your homework, next page. All right, and don't forget, you can also check the product. Remember pot of gold, had people type that in? Not registered. If it's unregistered, be wary. Next slide. You can also do research on stocks. And this one I may not leave in very long as a slide because if you want to go look up Apple and you want to see their proxy or you want to see their annual report, you can go to the SEC's website, search a company. Edgar is our name. It's our data analytic name. You just type it right in. It'll pull up every filing ever made by that company. That's how you can check and do your own research and pull the data for free on any security, any mutual fund, any ETF, and any bond. Go ahead. All right, so other red flags. Fraudsters have been looking for victims more and more through social media. I have seen numerous offerings on Facebook, on Twitter, for investments and ICOs, initial coin offerings. Bitcoin seems to be the hot mania right now. We've seen a lot of pot stocks here in Colorado. Better or worse, we're seeing a ton of hemp-related businesses. They're being solicited on the social media. It's hard for me to track them, right? I rely on reports from investors like you. If you see something concerning, if you're getting an unsolicited stock tip, or if it's someone you know, call me at the SEC. I will have someone run them through the company. I will help you find out if they're registered or not. I will give you the disclosure information. And if it's a fraud, I'll investigate it and will help others. Be careful of those can't miss offers. And I've heard recently of MLM marketing scams uh, uh, within the military, targeting those to help then sell forward. So be wary if you're starting to get texts or social media on that. Next slide. Affinity frauds. Again, 
you are a member of an identifiable group. You are in the military, and people love to target the military because they know you have a steady income stream, right? So we are seeing affinity frauds targeting military schemes. Additionally, in Colorado Springs specifically, while I can't tell you who they are, I can tell you there are several active boiler rooms currently in Colorado Springs, and there have been numerous unregistered products being sold through our local community, through our churches, and around the city. So unfortunately, you're living in a hot affinity fraud area. Fraudsters love to join the group like Robert Ray White samples, and they come in stealthy, and they are slow patient. These aren't smash and grab criminals. They're going for the big game and the long game. You may know their children, you may know their wives, and then one day they're gone. Finally, um, the person telling you about the investment might have also been scammed, right? I'm getting a great rate of return. So be wary of that as well. Next slide. Planning for retirement. This is my favorite part. Next slide. Wait, all of you said you're in the TSP, right? Is anybody, well, I'm not going to point you out then. <laughs> I love the TSP. I, too, am an investor in the TSP. I love it. And we're going to talk about it a little bit, but here are some factors to consider when you're investing either inside the TSP or outside. What's your age? When do you plan to retirement? What's your risk tolerance? And what sort of diversity do you need? Next slide. Um, how many of you have taken the BRS? You've all mandatory taken the BRS training, right? You've made your decisions. How many of you have made your decision and you're in and you're good? Nice. Okay. So um, I'm not going to spend much time on this because we have less than five minutes next. So I'm going to skip, skip, skip. Give me one more, one more, one more, one more. TSP. Okay. Um, actually, one more slide. Some of the benefits of the TSP, it's easy to enroll. You know that saving is automatic. It has low fees and expenses, and it's got good tax benefits. On the next slide, I think I have the expense ratio. Here's, here's what we are talking about. Remember that $30,000 you can save by paying lower fees? A typical index fund is about $1.80 per share, right, per $1,000. This is, the TSP is 0.38 cents. That right there, look at the difference. I personally have rolled more money from my private accounts into the TSP because of the fees. The fees are so cheap. So consider that if you have outside accounts and inside accounts and the assets are similar and the investment options are similar, consider how much you're leaving on the table for fees. Next slide. Actually, um, and do you guys have questions about a traditional IRA versus a Roth IRA? Traditional? Okay. Next slide. All right, well, and one more slide, I want to get to the, this one. So within the TSP, as you know, there are five major funds, government securities, fixed income, common stock fund. Uh, oh, I always forget the S. Ah, oh, small cap, thank you, small business, and income fund, thank you. You can see that the risk goes up with the, the diversity, as does the usual performance, as does volatility. So if you go to the next slide, they have the life cycle funds. These are target date funds. These are ETFs, essentially, low fees. So ETFs, again, being exchange traded funds. These are life cycle funds, and they have your target date of retirement. I'm trying to get to 2030, man. I'm working really hard towards 2030. That means when I first started investing in the TSP 18 years ago, I was in, they didn't even have these back then, actually. But I did it myself, and I was more in stocks and more in, um, the, uh, in international funds. But as I'm getting closer and closer, I'm getting less risky. I need that money. I don't want to be stuck in the market when it hits high. So I've now ratcheted it back. I'm in 2030, and you can see I'm getting more of the, the G funds getting bigger in each time I go through it. The income fund is getting bigger each time you get closer to retirement. And then if you're retired now, see it's all almost in fixed income. It's paying a steady rate of return. So we have about one minute left, or two, and I would love to answer any question you have on any topic, well, securities related, <laughs> or BWE. I could talk about being the best wife ever. Yes, sir. I have a question about corporate bonds. Yes. Um, let's say a corporation X, Y, and Z borrows a bunch of money from a bank, they go bankrupt. That bank has rights to whatever that corporation's assets are. Correct. Do, do corporate bondholders have any kind of... Yes. That That's actually a great question. So um, I'm going to... What you're talking about is in a liquidation or in a reorganization. So a Chapter 7 or a Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Company goes bankruptcy. They're either 7 or 11. 
Um, the seven is liquidation. Thirteen is reorganization. What they're talking about, when you go through the bankruptcy process, there are certain levels of creditors who are paid out before others. So usually it's, I mean, there's employee stock option plans are usually pretty high, so the employees have to get paid. Then corporate debtors, creditors, right, lenders, banks get paid. As a corporate bondholder, you are at that same level of priority above shareholders. Shareholders have the lowest priority and usually get 100% wiped out. So the order of priority, if you are, you're similar to a lender, you're maybe not first priority lender, but you're in that same class as a lender, as a bank lender, and you do have rights. But it, it only gets paid out if there's money. So it goes employees, corporate bonders, hopefully to the bondholders, and very rarely does it get to the stockholders. So that's the order of priority of liens in bankruptcy. So you do have rights to pay out in bankruptcy, but let's hope they never go bankrupt and make a ton of money, right? Another question. Do you guys feel like you're smarter investors? You guys gonna go drop some blue chip stocks? Oh wait, did somebody have a question? Oh, I missed her, I apologize. Yes. Yes. Is it for account or is it for individual? It's per account. It's per account. It's 250. And I'm gonna actually mention something else on that. So there's FDIC. So he asked, on your individual account, when you pull up to the bank teller window, you know, and it says FDIC insured, it's per account and it's per $250,000. And you should read the fine print. Just double check it. And if you have a question, go in and talk to your bank counselor, but get it in writing and go to the FDIC.gov website. There's actually an FDIC.gov. They are an organization like the SEC. But for securities, even though there's no investment risk protection, there is something called SIPIC, the Securities Investment Protection Corporation. So SIPIC is protection for your account if your broker dealer, if the firm goes under. So remember back in the tech crash and, and Lehman and the financial crisis and Lehman went bankrupt. Lehman's gone, one of the most venerable firms. Bear Stearns, bankrupt, gone. But the account holders, your account is protected by the federal government, by SIPIC. So it doesn't protect you from making a bad investment decision and investing in a bankrupt company. But if your, uh, your, your company, Fidelity, goes bankrupt, your account is protected by the federal government, up to certain limits. So there is insurance for the broker-dealer itself. So there is some protection there. Any other questions? You guys are awesome. Thank you. <laughs>